My name is Joe Filipek. I'm the Continuing Education Manager here at Rails. Once again, thank you for coming uh, to this workshop today. So uh, I just want to give a couple of reminders, upcoming events. Uh, March 11th, we are going to have Miguel Figueroa, who is uh, the head of ALA's Center for the Future of Libraries, uh, come here to Burr Ridge to talk about the future of libraries and, and specifically, you know, what are those external forces um, what are those trends that are influencing libraries and influ influencing our users and, and also talking about libraries and librarians who are kind of thinking in that uh, future tense as it were. So that's March 11th in the afternoon. It will be here in Burr Ridge, but we'll also have some video conferencing locations uh, if you want to attend there. Also streaming online, so um, you can register for that. There are still spots open. And also uh, in April, April 16th and 17th, we're going to have some grant writing workshops. So a grant writing expert will come out, do a couple half-day workshops, uh, one at Ju Joliet Junior College, another at the Schaumburg uh, Public Library. Uh, again, grant writing specifically for librarians, how to find them and how to go through that grant application process, how to good, good, write a good grant application and so forth. So those are a couple uh, upcoming events. Uh, on to today, this is the first of what will be a series of workshops uh, that we will be doing as a partnership with Rails and, uh, and Booklist on the topic of um, Reader's Advisory titled RA and More, Practical Advice for Public and School Librarians. Uh, so you're going to want to watch for more of these opportunities forthcoming that are on topics about Reader's Advisory collection development and so forth. Um, I will also say if there's a topic you come out of here thinking like it would be great to have a training or workshop on this, I'd love to hear from you. So either, you know, find me after the workshop, I've got my card back there, email, phone call. I'm always happy to hear from you guys. So I do want to welcome our two presenters today. We have Rebe Rebecca Vanuk, looking at referencing. And Karen Keith is director currently at the Hinsdale Public Library. Experience at Reader's Advisor, I think head of Reader's Advisory at Deerfield, mm -hmm. and I know is also chair of the Adult Reading Roundtable. So we're really glad. You looked at my bio. I know. <laughs> <laughs> driving in. Um, really happy to have them both here. I think we'll bring a lot of uh, expertise, experience, and so forth to you guys. So with that, I'll turn it over to them. Great. Thank you, Joe. So as Joe said, I'm Rebecca. I'm Karen. And uh, we're going to talk to you today about different book blogs. And I'll give you a little bit of background on that. Um, we actually write the blog Shelf Renewal, which for a long time was hosted on our own site. And then it was hosted at Library Journal. And then when I got my position at Booklist, it's now Booklist took it over from us. And we still write for it. Um, and it's part of their suite of blogs, the Booklist Reader, which I will talk about in mere moments. <laughs> but uh, Shelf Renewal is a blog that is devoted to backlist titles. So we kind of decided, what was sort of our thinking? We were, we were tired We wanted of, to be Nora Rawlinson. Yes, we wanted to be Nora Rawlinson. <laughs> we will talk about her as well. Um, and we kind of decided, you know, all of the best-selling books are the ones that get all of the hype and all of the chatter and all of the talk, and that's what people come in for, and they're never on the shelf, and they need something else to read. You don't want to send them away empty-handed. So we decided we were going to have a book blog that focused strictly on backlist titles and what we call dusty books and things like that. So that is Shelf Renewal. Hopefully you are either already familiar with it or you will go back to work and become familiar with it. But um, as, as blog writers, we're obviously big fans of blogs as well. And we realized that some librarians might not think it's worth their time um, the investment to follow a lot of blogs, which we just think is crazy. You know, we like them so much that we started our own. And this, this, this program, Readers, Writers, Books, and Blogs, was conceived in 2008, actually. Um, I had done one of those Library 2.0 initiatives at the library I was working at at the time, and I was shocked to find out that virtually no one on the staff at that time followed any library-related blogs at all. So that was one of the assignments, was to start finding library-related blogs. And so the more that I found them, we kind of decided, well, we should really put this into a program. So we've done a version of this program for the last, 
how many years is that? Seven. <laughs> I'm a librarian, not a mathematician. Um, seven years, and we've changed it, obviously. <laughs> I'm going to show you the same yes. slides yes, from 2008. Oh, wait, that one doesn't exist anymore. Let's go on. No, we, we update it every single time. As a matter of fact, just yesterday, I was getting fresh screenshots. Um, and we, we let a lot of stuff go as it becomes not very relevant. And we will, I'll point out some of the ones that have been on this program since the beginning because there's some, you know, long standing, really good blogs. But, um, you know, so that's kind of the, the, the background and history of this and, and what we do. So we kind of just thought, thought of it as, you know, if you're, if you're not looking online for your book news, then you are several months behind. And in the library, that that doesn't fly. Your patrons have already heard about this stuff. They're coming in and putting on holds before things are published, so you need to know about them. And blogs, websites are a great way to find that out. So, so here's just a, a little overview of what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about how to find and evaluate blogs. This isn't about writing blogs. This isn't about search engine optimization. This isn't about getting on other people's blog rolls. This is really what's already out there and how you as hopefully a fan but a practitioner can use that information to help with your professional responsibilities, collection development, book lists, updating your website, um, and then also your face-to-face -face interactions with your patrons. We're going to talk about best blogs by category because we're librarians and we have to put everything in a category. Um, really the, the blending of blog, website, social media presence is you know stronger now than it ever has been. A lot of things that we highlight as blogs you might not even think of as a blog the just the simple free templates are so much better I mean everything that was a blog used to look like a blog yeah. now there are sites that you and your patrons visit that you don't even realize are a blog you think of them as a site or you might know this franchise through its podcast or through the voice of someone who's got a really strong Twitter presence but it started off and is still doing a lot of its upkeep on the blog side and so that's a few other must-know sites. And then how to share with patrons, some tips on how you're going to use this information in your day-to-day -day work. The blogs versus websites. Um, when I was looking at these sites again last night, one of the things that really struck me was the tone, that the people who are maintaining these sites are passionate about what they do. I mean, they are just advocates, especially in the genres. They love writing about this, being the first to know, sharing it. And as the people who are doing that for our patrons all the time, to take the passive seat and have someone do that for you is really relaxing and invigorating. So it was just personally fun for me to look at all of those again. You know, a, a site that's just information is a Wikipedia entry. And that's fine if all you need is that kernel of information. What blogs introduce is that voice, you know, that perspective that someone's coming from, the way that they want to talk about things. And Rebecca and I are going to talk a lot about kind of how that shifts and how uh, the format changes or that person's interests change. And so that tone or that voice can become more relevant to you. It can be the reason that you continue following someone or it can be the reason why eventually it's no longer relevant for you. Um, conversation and comments, that's something else that's really unique to blogs and now we see it in some of the other social media. Some sites choose to turn it off because it's just too much to moderate. I mean, going through your spam filter alone can be a full-time job for some larger sites. But I think we're now in a culture where a lot, I mean, I hear people say all the time, like, the comments were more interesting than the article, like, especially if you have local school board elections. <laughs> so that can be part of the appeal or part of a detraction for you when you're evaluating whether a site is going to be relevant to you. And the currency, you know, a, a website, the, the main page tends to be static unless they choose to have a carousel in the center, but blogs are arranged by chronological order. So the, the newest feed, and we're so used to that with Twitter and Facebook, always seeing the most current information first. And some of these, you know, it, it's like the airport CNN of libraries. They know that they're capturing new readers every hour, every two hours. I mean, someone can tell you exactly what that metric is. And so you'll see them reposting things because they know that at lunch break, I get another set of readers at like 4.30 where people don't want to start a new project, I get another set of readers. And so you'll see those things repopulating because they want those eyeballs, especially if they're generating revenue from their site. They're like really canny about when they're going to get the most links. Um, tone. Let's talk just real quickly about okay. the casual tone. Um, 
and as you said, when we go through, we'll talk about the voice on some of these and why that's such an appeal. But um, I just want to caution that some of these are a lot less formal than what we might be used to, especially looking at library sites. Um, you think of things as needing to be professional and formal, and blogs are anything but. Um, they, we have swearing on some of them even. Even on our so, handout, yes. there's some words. <laughs> so if, if that upsets you, well, then just don't look at those blogs. <laughs> That's the, they, they're not going to change. This is, um, we talk a lot about wanting to, to find that voice and have that voice be a character on the blog. So sometimes that is um, informal and unprofessional. But just, just a warning, just a warning. So how to read. A blog. <laughs> and not literally, because you all know how to read. But how do you how do you decide when you're going to look at your blogs, and how do you follow them, and how do you read them? Um, your best bet is to sign up for a blog reading service or RSS feed reader. Um, I'm always kind of surprised at how few people know that or want to do that. I, I think you even, you don't anymore, do you? You do it all by social media now, I do. Right? I, I figure Monica Harris and Leah White know everything that I should know, and if they're posting a link to an article, that's what I, I mean. I let my social network curate a lot of what I'm reading. Yeah, this has changed a lot. Like, every time we've done this program, we have to change the way we talk about this and, and what we suggest. We used to have a whole slide on how to pick an RSS feed reader, <laughs> a whole slide of like, you know, 17 different available readers, and there just aren't even, I don't even know if half of those are even available anymore because that's the nature of the web. Um, and two years ago, Google Reader shut down, which freaked a lot of people out, including yours truly, because I was like, what? I, how do I read my blogs anymore? Um, and so that, you know, we tried to go through and find suggestions, and it's just, you're all librarians, you can Google RSS feed readers and decide what's right for you. I happen to use Dig Reader right now, which looks very much the same as the old Google Reader did, so that was that really clinched it for me. Um, and Dig, if you dig.com itself acts as a generic feed reader. They're pulling what is getting clicked on the most, what people are talking about the most online, and they give you this like digest of 25 top articles. So that's my lunch hour reading right there. And then I switch over to my reader on Dig, which has the sites that I've personally chosen to look at. So that's something I suggest. But you know, the landscape is changing. Dig might not be around next month. I don't know. Landscape is always changing. And most so. email platforms will let you yes. send an RSS feed to yourself. So especially if this is something that you're reading exclusively for personal or exclusively for work, it might be nice to attach it to that email address because it'll be a trigger for you to look at it. Yeah. One of the nice things about having a feed reader is once you have it set up and you've got stuff stuck into it, then you can just sit back and let the good times roll. You don't have to work on it anymore. The reader automatically saves new posts. Um, at your convenience, you can go in, see them all, etc. So, how many of you currently use an RSS feed reader? Not very many. Which <laughs> ones? Which one do you use? If I'm to ask. Dig. Okay. I use uh, Feedly and Newsblur. Feedly and what was the other one? Newsblur. News Newsblur. Okay. I don't know that one. Write that one down. Joe, what do you use? Uh, Feedly. Well. Feedly. All right. Excellent. How do you find blogs to put in your blog reader, Karen? All right. There's a thing called Google. It's G-O-O. -O. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, blog rolls, you know, once you find the one site, finding referrals from that. Again, it's like your social media. People talk about other things that they like, and you kind of expand your pool. That's a great way. If you have a specific need that you're trying to fill, really, a Google search or asking someone else for a referral is going to be a great way to start. Evaluating it, there's so much out there and you can't subscribe to everything, you can't follow everything, and so you need to be critical and your priorities and what is really important to you is going to be very subjective, but it's also going to change on whether they're personal or professional interests, whether this is something that you're going to be using to share with your department or your management team. Appearance, not to be vain, but if the site has so many pop-ups or if it's you know all 10 point times new roman text 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 it's not going to be an enjoyable place to spend time so the content is going to have to be fantastic to keep you going back and if that's the case that's fine i mean look at um craigslist it's the ugliest thing in the world but the content is so unique and so valuable that they don't need to do anything to change that. The currency, when we go back and evaluate this, anything that hasn't been updated in two weeks to a month, 
we assume is no longer being maintained. I mean, the, the expectations in 2015 for someone to be posting very, very frequently are high. And so you're probably going to find the sites that aren't maintained. There are so many other ones that are. That's where you're going to put your time and attention. Again, the comments, whether they tend to be off topic, whether they really add something to the commentary, that's going to be something that's going to vary site to site. The, the tone, again, they're not going to change. And if this person uses a lot of profanity or is very casual, and this slips into relevancy, if more and more they're talking about their kids or a gluten-free lifestyle, if you've become a fan and you really like their tone and the way that they're telling stories, you might continue to follow them because you have a relationship with this person now. But if really, like, I just need to know about graphic novels, dude, then you might need to find a different graphic novel site Stop to follow. Stop posting pictures of your cat! <laughs> <laughs> and we talked about blog <laughs> rolls, it's true. Um, the, you know, it's like the online dating of websites. You know, you can completely troll and see what else is out there. Yes, and do you all know what a blog roll is? That okay. list normally over on the right-hand yeah, side. So a blog roll, and uh, we might see some on some of these screenshots. So most blogs, ours included, um, when you have blogs that you know are similar to you, it's like read-alikes for Reader's Advisory. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> um, put it they, in context. Right, right, put it in context. Um, off to the side, it, they, a lot of blogs will have what is called the blog roll. And it's kind of like, if you like us, you might like XYZ, or hey, these are blogs that I follow. And it's just links to other blogs. And that's, that's how I find a lot of new things to look at for blogs, is I've got a blog that I like, and I'm like, well, what, what do they like? What, what people do they follow? What's, what's the deal? And you, you can find stuff that way. So trolling on a blog roll is a good way to find new blogs. So once you've found some blogs and you fill up your feed reader, breaking up with your blogs. Because once you have that, you're going to go nuts filling up your feed reader with 70 different blogs and more and more and more. Everything you see here, you're going to go back and put on your feed reader. <laughs> and then you're going to check it all the time. And it's going to be worse than Facebook. And you're going to be like, oh, Rebecca said that having a feed reader would make my life easier. Lie. Uh, no, you have to weed it, much like we weed our collections. You have to pare down your feeds to a manageable amount. So when it's time to weed, some criteria. The blog makes you feel bad. <laughs> like I so like, dramatic, right? If you've ever had a subscription to The New Yorker and it ends up being taller than your couch, <laughs> because like there's really good stuff and you really will be a better person if you read every single one. But I just can't. There will be, you know, blogs that you start to follow that there's something about it where it's just not the right fit for you. There's a reason you're not keeping up with it. Yeah. And you don't have to be honest with yourself about what that reason is, just acknowledge that there's a reason. And if every time you see that piling up, it makes you not want to go look at the other stuff because you feel so guilty, that's not working for you. Yeah, time to let it go. Only look at blogs that really interest you and are, are content that's valuable. Um, frequent and unexplained absences. As Karen said, if you're not updating on a monthly basis, you're not really a blog, you're just a website. So that's, you know, that's the thing that makes something a blog. So if you, if you have a site that you follow that sits in your feed reader and doesn't ever get updated, it's time to just pitch it right out of there. You're drifting apart. Maybe the blog is taking a different direction than when it first started. I have lots of blogs. We have taken off so many blogs no. <laughs> from here that started as, as book blogs. Either they were librarians or a lot of them were just people who like to read. And I'm going to post every book that I read and I'm going to make comments about it and people are going to follow me. And oh, look, now I have a kid, so I'm going to talk about <laughs> dirty diapers. Or look, my cat is so cute, I'm going to put cat pictures up. And sometimes that's OK if, if this is a person who's writing that you like their voice and and they do still keep talking about books every once in a while, and you want to keep that. But we have taken out at least 50 blogs over yeah. the last seven years, probably more, <laughs> um, that just weren't book blogs anymore. And yeah. sometimes they acknowledge that. There are, they will make a firm statement that says, hey, I've changed. You know, This used to be my book blog, and now it's my gluten-free dinner blog. Welcome. Um, and some of them don't acknowledge it, <laughs> and they think they are still book blogs. But, um, but yeah, when they start to change, you're just drifting apart. Um, yeah, it's it's and in this in the context of this program, you know, what we're talking about here is stuff that you can feel comfortable looking at while you're on desk, right? Your boss is going to go by and it's going <laughs> to see book covers. They're like, "Ooh, they're working," as opposed to like, "Here's my dinner." Like, that's not really work. Um, so these are all these are all things that we're we're making pertinent to your work. Um, boredom, yes, and um, one of one of my big things with my reader is. 
I generally go in at least once a week to look at it. Sometimes more if I'm not busy, maybe it's every two weeks. But as soon as I start to see that I have several weeks worth of posts building up for a particular blog, I really have to stop and say, okay, why am I not looking at that anymore? Is it like the New Yorker that mm -hmm. I'm just piling up because it makes me look like I'm all pretentious <laughs> and everything? Um, or am I not really interested? And then just get it out of your feed reader. It's virtual space, so it's not like you're to be red pile next to the bed, <laughs> but still virtual space is clutter and it's you can just get rid of it. So without further ado, what you've been waiting for, our list of best blogs for book lovers. And so for each one, you know, we're going to try and highlight what's so special about it. When you're filling an informational need, there needs to be a gap. You know, there needs to be a difference between what this person knows and what you know. If you're just reading something because it reinforces, like this person likes all the same stuff I do, that's great, but it's not really expanding or filling your pool. So be a little honest with yourself about the appeal and, you know, is there anything more about this subgenre that I could possibly learn to be good at my job? For some people in sub subgenres, that answer is no. Like you have mastered it. You are a ninja in the paranormal Cleveland romance subgenre. Um, and so, if people come to your library asking for other kinds of books, then it would behoove you to become familiar with some other kinds of sites. What's in it for me? How am I going to use this? So there are some sites that are really great for prepub information, and you're going to use those for collection development. You're going to use those to look like a smarty pants when the person comes in and be like, John Sanford is starting a new series. It's so exciting. It's his first female protagonist. You know, it. One of the things that we talk about a lot at my library is demonstrating our expertise. And so being on top of that kind of stuff really gives you a credibility and demonstrates your expertise in the book landscape in your community. And the one or why would I use it? Am I using this to learn about something that's completely foreign to me? Am I learning it so that I can have casual conversations with my patrons? Am I using it so that I can make a presentation because we're doing a genre study and it's going to be my turn to do historical fiction in five months and so I'm really trying to get a flavor of all of these different subgenres. And just a quick word on how we're going to take this tour of blogs. Um, here in the program, we have screenshots of each blog. In the interest of time, it's more prudent to do it that way than to actually type in and go to each site. So you're not going to see um, long posts of anything or be able to search anything on these sites. But the best way for you guys to work with this, both in person and um, at home via YouTube, um, is to take the handout and mark off the ones that you think are the most interesting to you and then go back to them later and search the site and explore and see everything that they have to offer because we're just showing the home page of each of these sites. So speaking of the handout, looks a little something like this. And this is going to be available on booklistonline.com. If you simply search readers, writers, books, and blogs, you will come up with a printable handout. So our first category is General. General knowledge, Alex. General knowledge for 200. So the first blog we're going to talk about. What? The Booklist Reader. <laughs> um, so the Booklist Reader, as I mentioned at the top of the program, is home to a number of different blogs, including Shelf Renewal, Audiobooker, Book Group Buzz, and more. Booklist editors and freelancers write about everything from adult books to kid lit, print and ebooks, audio and video, from editor's rants to author interviews to lists, book news, and much more. And I'm not just saying this because I work at Booklist and we're <laughs> awesome, but seriously, if you are looking for kind of a one-stop shop on all things library related yeah. and book related, um, we even have a series now called Publishing You or You Publish, which is, really which interesting. is about you know, how to be, how to get your work out there. We, we really cover this, because we have so many people writing for this blog, um, from professional editors to freelancers who are librarians in the field, um, we have a wide range of opinions and information out there. And this is updated several times, um, several times a day sometimes, mm -hmm. depending. We do try to space them out so we're not all falling on top of each other, but it is very frequently updated and it's a good kind of catch-all general literature spot. So that's the book list reader. Early word, early word. 
We, we talked about her <laughs> earlier. Uh, the brainchild of Nora Rawlinson, who is the, a former editor for Library Journal and Publishers Weekly, and she is a publisher darling. All of the publishers love her. We love her. She's very delightful and nice. And so they give her all of their, they feed her all of their pre-pub information before they feed it to anybody else. So Early Word, um, the goal of Early Word is to help librarians stay ahead of public demand and to identify hidden gems. So since she has all of these industry connections and a librarian's sensibility, she likes to give everybody the heads up on everything that your patrons are going to ask for shortly. We always call it a web-based crystal ball. So um, early word, we have to give the proper shout out to, she was the, she's our reason for being. <laughs> we were listening to her talk about the site at an ALA conference in 2008 here in Chicago. And Karen and I were sitting in the audience and we were already familiar with early word and big fans of it, used it a lot on the desk. And realized though, this is when we kind of like, you know, she talks exclusively about yeah. pre-pub stuff. How can we, how can we be her? How can we do what she does? <laughs> but we can't talk about what she's talking about. What do we want to talk about? And backlist. So that's how we created Shelf Renewal. So Early Word is definitely, if you, if I was ranking these, Book Illustrator first, <laughs> Early Word second. Those are your top two blogs you have to go back and follow. I have this, um, because I can't be trusted to check my Twitter feed every day, I have this as the landing page of one of my browsers on my work computer, so that at least once a day I'm seeing the main page. Because she's really good about putting the book covers, about good headlines, so that I'm just subconsciously absorbing it so that when I read about it somewhere else in a couple days, I'm like, oh, Ooh, there's something. That. Nora already told me about yeah, that. Yeah, it's just a really great way. I mean, it's exactly what she promises. It's a fantastic way to learn about the connections between what's going on in the world, like the Oscars and the publishing industry, and what your patrons are going to be asking about, like, literally the next day. Yeah. She also has a feature where she goes into um, various library catalogs and checks your holds and then kind of reports back and says well here's this book that I've been talking about now for a couple of weeks and I see that Chicago Public already has 400 holds on this book and Cleveland Public has 200 holds maybe you all want to start <laughs> buying it so and the galley chats yes, have you ever done one yes so galley chat is something that she does on Twitter is it once a month I think so once a month uh, where she people just come on it's it's about a dozen, 25 or so-ish mm -hmm. librarians on a regular basis who come in and just have this Twitter conversation about the pre-pub stuff that they've been hearing about or the advanced reader copies that they've been getting from um, publishers, and we're going to talk about that in the next site, how to get some of those. Um, and it's, it's kind of this just informal way of chatting about new books that are yeah. coming out. So be familiar with Early Word. And also be familiar with Library Reads. So Library Reads is a, is a fairly new initiative. I think it's been around for a year or so now. And um, this is a group that Nora actually <laughs> is part of. She, she helped spearhead this. It is a group of librarians who run it, though, on the steering committee. And what it is is every month, librarians from across the country, and you can participate too, vote on the top 10 upcoming books that are coming out from publishers. Now these are not going to be your bestseller titles that we know everybody is asking for. This is again that kind of mid-list stuff. A lot of, lot of great book club books come yeah. out of here and a lot of very specific genre titles come out of here. So everybody votes on these books that they think patrons are going to want to hear about. Um, it's a great way to get yourself into getting advanced reading copies as well once you start into this program. There's more information on their site on how to join them right there on the corner. Um, and they work through, you can get print copies from some of the publishers, although they really like to work a lot through Edelweiss and NetGalley to get you digital galleys. But again, more information on there. Um, really a nice way to just kind of keep on the forefront of what your patrons are going to be talking about and what you need to be talking to them about. IndieBound um, is another, it's my go-to. I consider their trade paperback bestseller list my best tool for book group recommendations because that's how things get on the bestseller list because people are buying 12 to 20 copies of something at a pop because book groups have just started doing it. It's the site for the, and I don't want to get their name wrong, but I probably American will. American Booksellers Association. American Booksellers Association. Um, and so it's got that indie sensibility. Again, people who are just really passionate about what they do, um, celebrating those special things, especially the authors that are really good to bookstores, the authors that will go 
go out and sign autographs and help put chairs away after, you know, they give them a special shout out and it's a nice thing for you to be aware of as well. Entertainment Weekly. They do the ratings, you know, A to F, which is always kind of snarky and fun. And their reviews are always about 100, 125 words. It skews a little bit more towards fiction, the nonfiction that they cover. It's going to be like the Malcolm Gladwell. It's going to be like what you see people reading on the train. Entertainment Weekly is about pop culture, so no surprise. That's the kind of stuff that they feature. Their nonfiction reviews also cover a lot of crossover with the entertainment industry, so celebrity biographies. Um, behind the scenes of Bravo Real Housewives, celebrity cookbooks, those are gonna get a shout out. This is a great thing. If you feel like you've been out of the loop for a little week, or for a little week, for a little bit, look at like the last four weeks of their book reviews and you are immediately back up to speed. Men reading books, I love their tagline, book summaries and opinions written by guys about books that other guys might consider reading. The, <laughs> the library and publishing industries are very female heavy. And so, you know, women are the gatekeepers of a lot of this information and promotion. And so to read about how our male readers are talking about what connections they see, what they think a similarity for a certain author be, is not always intuitive to the female mind. And so it's a really great way because you most likely have men who come in and use your library and it's uh, very nice to them to be able to talk in a way that is meaningful in terms of making recommendations. No shelf required. We all are seeing something every day about the ebook landscape. This is updated frequently. One of the things that I like about this is it also touches what's happening with some of the independent or small publishers. You know, if you have an audience for some of these subgenres in your library that the big platforms aren't covering, it's really important to know what could be coming so that when you're making decisions about where to put your budget dollars or when you're having a management level discussion about, you know, do we want to stay with this platform? Where do we see the big areas for growth? This will give you a lot of good background information. The Millions. Um, I really like this. It's an online magazine. It's somewhere between The New Yorker and The Believer. Lots of book reviews, skews very heavy on the literary fiction and nonfiction, focuses a lot on like young, smart, super hip writers. If you want to see pictures of what's in Zadie Smith's fridge, this would be the site that you would go to. If no one in your community cares about that, then I would go back to the Entertainment Weekly site. <laughs> Book Riot. Um, I would put this in the top three. Book list reader, obviously. Early word. And Book Riot, not just for this site, but for their whole media presence. They've got the great blog. Um, what I love about them is that their staff have an opinion about everything. If there's something going on in the publishing industry, there are articles, there are Twitter conversations, there are podcasts. Like They are on it and they have strong opinions and they have followers who vocally disagree with them. So you get great conversations. Their podcast is fantastic. Almost all of their contributors, maybe all, have individual Twitter feeds as well. And so if you follow them, you'll get to know those personalities. I think Amanda Nelson is like really smart and funny and says really provocative things um, about the, the treatment of women writers in the industry, especially media. Uh, so I follow her personally as well as Book Riot. Several of their contributors are librarians as well. Yay, though. So the next category is publishing. Galley Cat. <clears throat> Galley Cat is publishing news and industry gossip. Um, it has a hodgepodge of articles for writers and readers and those in the industry. I like to use Galley Cat because I want to keep up what's going on in the work, going on in the, in the book world, and they have a lot of interesting interviews and videos posted a lot. That's one of their kind of specialties. Um, the, you can also find a lot of book trailers posted on this blog. Do you remember when oh. you first stumbled onto this, though? Like, it was like peeking into uh, Sex in the City. I yes. mean, like, you really felt like you were getting this super cool inside look into yes. the hip New York City media it world. Is, it is definitely written for people in the publishing industry. It's not written for book lovers. It's not written for librarians. It's written for publishing people. Yeah. So you kind of get that little interesting, right? It's, it's, it's very in the know. Yeah, very in the know, very in the know. So that's a fun one. 
Nathan Bransford. So Nathan Bransford is a former literary agent, and for anyone interested in how a book gets published, this is the site to go to. He tells all. He has his blog that he um, writes on various booky topics every day, I think, every other day, very frequently. Um, but the highlight of his site is an extensive FAQ section um, all about the writing process, the publishing world, how to get things published. So he talks not only about the industry from an insider's point of view, but how to become one of those insiders. So anytime a patron asks you, you know, how do I get into publishing, or I'm thinking about this, this is, you need to send them to his site right away to read his frequently asked questions section. Like really practical, like, I had this manuscript, but I don't have a good title. Is it better just to put on, like, what I've been thinking about or leave it blank? Will an editor help me with that? I mean, yeah. really nitty-gritty stuff. Nitty-gritty advice. Very excellent. The next category is reader's advisory stuff. Our nearest and dearest, close to our heart. Um, so the first site that we're going to talk about, RA for All. So Reader's Advisory Librarian, Instructor, and close personal friend of ours, <laughs> disclaimer, <laughs> Becky Spratford. I'm hoping you all know Becky. Um, this is her blog, and she dishes on Reader's Advisory, featuring what she's reading, what her patrons at the Berwyn Public Library are reading, and what her students at Dominican University are learning about. Um, her site is very clean, very unpretentious, and one of her big strengths here, um, I love it when she posts after her book group meetings because she really talks about here was this book that we did I'm gonna give you all this information about this book here's what I expected our meeting to look like and here's what it actually looked like so and so said this this person said that I was really taken aback to find out that somebody had that opinion about it we started the conversation moved into this it's like being in somebody else's book club without having to spend the two hours with them. <laughs> It's really nice. Um, and Becky is so smart. Like the way that yeah. she talks about books is so smart. And the way that she talks about books, she is a total book pusher. Like yes. she, you will want to read everything that she talks about because she's so enthusiastic and so really wants you to read this. And so I really, her is one of my favorite sites. We have too many favorite well, sites Well, and here. the We're stuff that she shares <laughs> from her class too is really, yeah. really interesting in terms of, people just starting to look objectively at themselves as readers and be like, I have preferences. I have things that I really like or lean to. I mean, it, you can. she sees that light bulb moment every semester and writes about it in a way that's really helpful when you're talking to your own staff about how they can transfer what they've identified about themselves in terms of reading and be like, and so your patrons also have certain habits that you are not going to change. If they say they don't like this, don't keep, like I know you don't normally like mysteries, but if you have that conversation with them every month, they're gonna stop coming in on Tuesday nights because the lady who always tries to get me to read mysteries works on Tuesdays. Yeah, yeah. So she's really kind of a, a great one-stop reader's advisory shop. The next site is the Reader's Advisor Online, and this is the free side to um, ABC, Clio, uh, ABC Clio's Libraries Unlimited database, the Reader's Advisor. Uh, this is um, their blog portion of that. It's got all kinds of good information, including tips and trends, brief articles on the profession, and one of the things that's great here is um, the weekly updates. They tell you what's new on the bestseller list, links to different things. Um, they also have this kind of semi-regular roundup of reader's advisory stuff that's being talked about online. So it's kind of a good, I go in and glance at that and see what do I need to catch up on. The next site that we're going to talk about is called Blogging for a Good Book. And this is the blog of the Williamsburg, Virginia Library. And um, the reason I've always liked to showcase this, I think this might be one that we've talked about since the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, if you are looking to do a blog at your library, this would be the one to kind of emulate. They, uh, everyone on their staff, not just librarians, everyone on their staff is charged with writing a review a day. It's part of their workload, it's part of what they do. And the, they get up on the site, and what's kind of nice about it is they don't just do books, they also feature DVDs and audiobooks. And there are enough people, I think that the interesting quality on this one is there are so many of them contributing that there are so many voices on there yeah. that you kind of get this full picture of. It's your collection. Right, it's your collection. It's somebody who likes YA stuff. It's somebody who likes all the feature film DVDs that come in. It's somebody who likes those cozy mysteries. Oh no, we've got somebody who likes the serial killer mysteries. <laughs> like we, it really, it's a yeah. wide variety and a, a, a wide uh, number of voices on there, which is really nice. 
And then we have Lisa's book critiques. So this is one of those personal blogs where she stays strictly to books. Lisa never talks about her cats or her dinner <laughs> or her grandkids or anybody like that. Um, it's all about books. So Lisa is a seasoned book reviewer and a library administrator in Indianapolis or Indiana. Um, she blogs about books that she's in interested in. It's, she has an emphasis on mystery. Um, she does cover everything from romance to general fiction to young adult. But she's one of the ones that I think has kind of risen to the cream of the crop of these sort of, this is not my library's blog, this is my personal book blog. And she's a great example of how to do something and do it well. She has a singular focus. These are books that I'm interested in. These are not books that publishers are sending me because they want me to promote their titles. These are not books, whatever. These are just stuff that I'm interested in. So she's got old stuff, she's got new stuff, and she's been active since 2005, and she's very active. She yeah. posts at 400 posts a year. Yeah. So she has this wealth of reviews available in her archives. So Lisa's book critiques. The next category we have is genres. Take it away, Karen. Okay, so this is one of those sites that has a little language in it. Um, it's called Smart Bitches Trashy Books. So I'm now on camera for the world to see saying that word. Uh, <laughs> what, what I love about them is that they love what they do and they embrace the absurdity and it in no way detracts from their genuine affection for the genre. And so they have contests, they do reviews. They, one of the contests they've done is they write a book review in the terms of a personal ad, and then people try and guess what book or what protagonist that personal ad has been written in the voice of. They get a lot of advanced readers' copies, and so they're able to show that. They have a really strong community, too. You know, people who follow them follow them, and so the comments can go on, and oh, I didn't think that, and well, you know how I feel about Scottish Lords, like, yeah, we do. Um, we all know that romance is one of the biggest genres in the publishing industry, and so this is a really great site to recommend to fans if you're comfortable recommending something with this title, um, or for you to become a little bit more familiar with the genre by someone who really loves it. The Liz and Lisa site used to be called Chicklet is Not Dead. Uh, they've morphed now more into general women's fiction. Again, they are fans. This is talking about, ooh, I love this one. Like, it reminded me so much. And then they'll have just like a squish about Jennifer Weiner for two posts. Uh, again, they do a lot of giveaways, a lot of promoting of other sites. Like, they're part of a good blogging community. They have really good author segments. They, yes. They, they actually, so they were, they were bloggers, and then they've written their own novels, which is why they decided to call it Lisa's <laughs> blog rather than Chicklet is not dead. The promotion, promotion, promotion. Um, and so they have lots of writer friends. So they have lots of author interviews with women's fiction authors and it's really good for that. And then even if the content weren't good, we'd have a slide because we just like saying smexy, smexy. books. <laughs> don't know. <laughs> One thing that, that I really like about this site is that it acknowledges the different kinds of romance and the different relationships that are featured in the romance genre. Um, they're, again, they, they mock because they love. One of the things that they do, I think, weekly, uh, it is weekly, it's Sex Scene Sunday, and so they pull out verbatim some really gorgeously crafted language um, from the genre. And it it's meant to, you know, be like, that sounds kind of good. I mean, I think there are a lot of people <laughs> Just give me the good parts. <laughs> who you know, do get recommendations for that. Like, that is a tone that I enjoy. Um, and it, you know, it's also fun. They really celebrate the breadth of the genre. And one thing that I really like, and they've had this up for years and years, is the bestsellers, romance, um, paid, and then they also have, and this is huge for fans in the romance genre, the free romance books. I mean, you know that your heavy um, romance readers, the people who used to subscribe to the Harlequin Book Club, they're doing, many of them, at least one book a day. And it's an expensive habit, and your print collection is only so big and is only ever going to be so big. So actually, romance readers were one of like the early, early adopters of eBooks. And so this is really valuable to direct your romance readers to. Historical fiction. So this blog is called Reading the Past. And uh, this is from Sarah Johnson, <clears throat> who is a reference and electronic resources librarian at a Midwestern university. She is a book review editor for the Historical Novels Review. And she reviews and writes about historical novels for Booklist, Novelist, and Choice, among others. And so she, her blog really just kind of previews upcoming historical fiction as well as backlist reviews. And she's one of the only people talking about 
um, historical fiction solely. So that's why we like to feature her. Um, back to Becky again. <laughs> uh, so Becky Spratford, in addition to just regular Reader's Advisory, you know, we love her, but she is also a horror maven. She's written several Reader's Advisory books on horror, and horror is kind of her thing. So she has a separate offshoot from her regular blog called RA for All Horror. Um, and what's nice about this is she has an index of horror reviews, information about publishers, awards, and other resources. Every October she does 31 days of horror, and so she really diligently posts every day about what she's reading, rounds up of other horror links, blogging about film and TV, and more. So this is, this is a good horror site. Okay, we're going to talk about graphic novels, um, comics worth reading. One thing that I really like, they subdivide, too, into those categories. So, like, the comics by women, the classic superheroes. They do some of the traditional comics. Like, there will be posts on here about, like, something new happening with DC or Marvel. Um, they're also good about talking about the industry and some of the changes that are happening with the... You wouldn't have thought that comic books would have been a no-brainer for digital, but that market has completely exploded and given some of these, you know, smaller imprints a huge national presence. I mean, it's a really exciting thing and not something I think a lot of people would have predicted. I think we would have thought that those collectors would be like the last ones to let go of their paper, but if it means they can have access to more, the answer is yes, please. You know, the things that you've been collecting and you've still got the boxes at your mom's house, you're probably still going to buy the print, but it's an opportunity to try new things and they're good about highlighting those as well. The no flying, no tights, this is... An oldie but a goodie. An oldie but a goodie. Um, one of the things I really appreciate them is that they, because they were one of the, the first of their kind, people just found them and were able to, you're my people. Like there's nobody in my town who reads this stuff. There's nobody in my library who reads this. And all of a sudden they had this fantastic resource and they like stepped up. They created a special FAQ for libraries be like, okay. Here are some core collections. They have recommendations and indexes for adults, teens, and kids, knowing that parents and readers and librarians, for some reasons, need to make those distinctions. And so we're going to help you identify which are best for those audiences. If you're a super fan, you already know this. If this is on your list of like things that I ought to know more about, this is like a really gentle, fun, smart, credible way to introduce yourself to the comics and graphic novel genre. On to mysteries. You know, for the longest time we had a hard time coming up with enough mystery sites for this because it seemed that either they the blogs weren't devoted strictly to mystery or they were blogs that were around for like two months and then they disappeared and stopped writing. And, um, you know, mystery is really, next to romance, a, a huge genre in libraries. So we felt we really had to get some mystery. So we've got four fine mystery sites for you. The first one is called The Rap Sheet. And they offer all kinds of good information on mystery and crime books. Um, the Rap Sheet covers reviews, news bits, articles of interest for mystery and crime fans. The next one is the cozy, cozy Mystery List. This is kind of a labor of love from one cozy mystery reader to whoever else finds her. She is, um, uh, I thought I knew who she was. Never mind, I don't know who she is. She, <laughs> she's, she's a mystery. Oh, she's a teacher, that's what it was. I figured she was, I'm like, I read this somewhere. I thought she was a librarian, she's a teacher. So she is a fan. And, What's particularly useful about her site is um, she has this page on cozy mysteries by theme. They are sp cozy specific. They have themes like hobbies, real people as characters. One is called I've Run Out of Agatha Christie, Christie, Agatha Christie Mysteries. Christie Mysteries. <laughs> what do I read next? Uh, no profanity and faith-based. Faith-based. <laughs> I'm just going to stop talking now. Faith-based mystery books. So her list are very, very good on the cozy mystery list. They'll edit that out in post. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> we can only hope. In reference to murder, this site provides a weekly recap of mystery-related TV shows, podcasts, movies, etc. Um, there is also this great forgotten books post every Friday. So this is a good site for genre fans or for those who need to do some catching up. They, um, there's a particularly good bibliography section, book and author lists, and then sections on mystery awards, bookstores, conferences, etc. 
And then one of my all-time favorite sites ever. We can't even really call it a blog. I don't care. I'm putting it in here anyway. Um, Stop You're Killing Me. So I have been recommending this site for years, literally, since 1999. Um, in 1999, I was the Reader's Advisory Librarian at the Morton Grove Public Library. Oh my gosh. And I did a program um, at a number of different library conferences that was called Talking to your books, no, talking to your patrons about books using the internet. That's that for a crappy <laughs> academic title, right? And uh, but you know the internet was cool and new. And what? How did we use it? To what? Like, is this gonna take my job away? We were all afraid of that. And so I had created this program of no, there are websites out there that you can use to help you in your job. And this has been on there since the beginning, since 1999. Going strong. Um, I like it, in case you can't tell. So the, what's so nice about this site is it has put every mystery book properly in its place. You can search. It's the librarian's dream. You can search by author, title, character name, character profession, place, time period. The list goes on. I think the only thing that's missing here is the searchable index of um, book covers by yes, color. Yes, by color. That's, I'm waiting for her to do that, and then my life will be complete as a reader's advisor. Um, so it's, it's really, it's hands down one of the best sites. I mean, you get the person that comes to you and says, so like three years ago I read this book about an Episcopalian priest who went on a mission to Africa in the 1700s and solved a crime. And I bet you can find it on here because she, right. what's the time period? Oh, he was an Episcopalian priest. There's a whole list of Episcopalian priest books. Africa, it's said in Africa. Like, and your patron will be like, wow. This is one of those, you're so smart. And books that, that were yeah. published in the UK in a different order and under a different title, cross-indexed yep. in here. Seriously, like librarian's if, dream. If it's librarian's not in dream. here, your patron got a huge chunk of information wrong, <laughs> or you should just go straight to Dorothy L. Like, really, this is going to answer 90 yeah. Eight percent of your general mystery. What's that book? Yeah. Questions. It's really fantastic. So stop. You're killing me. And now into the sci-fi. I'm sorry, SF. Um, fantasy. <laughs> fantasy. Wicked Little Pixie is super fun. It focuses mostly on paranormal romance and urban fantasy. You know, urban fantasy has just been like really creeping along over the past 10 years and has really kind of established itself as something that's not going to go away. The Jim Butcher books, I think, were like a big turning point for a lot of people. Um, Simon R. Green, his stuff kind of falls into that category. She tends to lean a little bit more towards the paranormal romance than the urban fantasy that's a little bit more crime-based, but she'll cover those as well. The next two, SF Signal and Locus, are both the offshoots of print magazines. And I am not in the culture, I'm, but this is just from looking at them, kind of my vibe. Um, SF Signal tends to be a little bit more narrowly focused on traditional science fiction. You know, a lot of the short story magazines, um, referencing older, obscure titles because the fans will read anything. They're not just looking for what's new, but really, really good information and a lot of information about crossovers. If something's getting a lot of attention because of a new serialization or a movie adaptation or somebody's moving to a new publisher and so they're going to be doing something with the backlist, this will have it because they just love sharing the information about it. Locus is a little, feels to me, um, a little broader in focus. Like, I don't think you're going to see Cory Doctorow featured in SF Signal. Locus is the place for him. It's been around for years, really well established, great information, great access to the authors because, like, this is one of the gold standards in that industry. Um, and you'll see, you know, that they're also featuring the Bram Stoker nominees. So their scope of fantasy and supernatural being a little bit broader than SF Signal. So on to some young adult sites. Uh, forever young adult. So <laughs> I always <laughs> laugh when I talk about it. Um, I got hooked on this site thanks to their chapter by chapter analysis of Flowers in the Attic, <laughs> which literally made me cry with laughter. And I was like, oh, I have found my people. <laughs> like, the, it's, it's, it was awesome. So it's very snarky, very smart, and very with it discussion of YA titles, both young and new, or both old and new. 
Um, but we have to warn people that, first of all, this is another one where a lot of their humor involves swearing. Um, but it totally works for them. They also cover a lot of YA TV and movies, so it's very much a pop culture site, not just a book site. But honestly, I don't think that I would know a third of the current YA titles that I know if I wasn't following this blog. And um, when we were putting this together, I realized that now one of the things they're talking about, they've moved away from Flowers in the Attic and they're on to um, Fifty Shades of Grey, <laughs> which is not at all appropriate for teenagers. <laughs> And so I kind of like cocked my head and went, Karen, what's up? And she reminded me, this is not a site for young adults. This is a site for adults who like to read young adult. So it's, so I wouldn't go back to your, your teen room and like start telling all your teenagers to stick, because half of them won't get the references anyway, especially, well, but you know. The reference, I mean, they're constantly like name checking John Hughes movies, yeah. which, you know, may not have a lot of relevance to the 14 year olds in your <laughs> but a community. But 14 year olds. <laughs> or, you know, like the Wakefield yeah. twins. When yes. they make that analogy, we're like, oh, a sweet valley high. Yeah. Again, the 15 year old girl over there, no idea yeah, yeah. what this that is, is. This is. This is for us, um, <laughs> lower middle-aged moms <laughs> who still like to be hip with the YA stuff. Because so. we call it the YA. The, y <laughs> the YA stuff. What are those crazy kids <laughs> reading these days? Uh, Guys Lit Wire. So according to their site, Guys Lit Wire was created after a broad discussion among YA bloggers within the lit blogosphere, uh, talking about the lack of books for teenage boys. So uh, the aim of this site is to bring literary news and reviews to the attention of teenage boys and the people who care about them. Aww. Their posts cover old books, new books, fiction and nonfiction alike in a very casual tone. And not casual swearing tone, but just casual, like we're talking to teenagers. We're talking to the YA. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking to teenagers tone. So, you know, kind of like talking to your friend about a cool book you think they might like. Guys lit wire. And then there's The Hub, which is the literature blog for YALSA, the Young Adult Library Services Association of ALA. Uh, their site aims to provide one-stop shopping for finding information about teen reads, including recommendations for great teen books, information about YALSA lists and awards, book trailers, and other book-related videos, and their best of the best lists with content created by both librarians and teens. Now, I wanted to stop here for a moment, actually. I'm going to surprise Karen here because I didn't tell her about this. And talk about the fact that there is a category that we are missing. There are actually two categories that we are missing. Only in two. Only two. Everything else is Everything comprehensive. Else we, we are missing two <laughs> categories in today's broadcast. And the first one is um, faith-based fiction or Christian fiction. We used to have um, one site that we talked about because people had asked us for it. and. It, was, it wasn't even its own site. It was a page on another, A paid newsletter. Yeah, on a paid newsletter, basically. And so we kind of stopped recommending that because it didn't really seem right. So I'm putting the plea out there to both you here in person and to those there in video land. If you have <laughs> um, a blog or frequently updated website on Christian fiction or faith-based fiction of any denomination, please share it with us. Uh, my email is probably the easiest one to remember. Yeah. It's rvnuk, rvnuk at ALA.org, let me know. Um, and the other category, which we are remiss in not having, is anything on uh, multicultural books. Oh, I've got books. another one, too. So oh, she's okay. got another one. But um, the, the problem with that is every time we've tried to put those in, the next time we go back to do the program, they're not there anymore. Yeah. Um, and what I'm finding right now, a lot of the, because there's a lot of chatter going on in the library world about we need diverse books and we need, we need this, and a lot of the blogs out there are not focusing so much on the books and reviews and recommendations. They're focusing on the issue about why we need this and what we need to do. And we want to focus on the books. So there's lots of author sites out there, but what I have been seeing, and this is just merely what I've been looking at. What I've been seeing is a lot of the author sites, um, it's their personal websites. So it's not, I'm looking for stuff that is book reviews of these you know, different ethnicities, multicultural books. So again, if you've got a favorite of that, please send it my way and we will make sure it gets into the next program. What else are we missing, Karen? Um, some perfect. people allegedly enjoy reading nonfiction oh. and occasionally come and ask us for recommendations or we purchase those books for our collections. Again, this is something, this is an area where things quickly um, change their focus, where someone has really good intentions of speaking 
generally about nonfiction, and then it's like Susie's train site. Yeah. Um, you know, she she finds that she's getting the most conversation about the train books. Um, you know, publishers are sending her train books, and so that becomes a focus. And you know, if we recommend a hundred different sites on a hundred different topics, that's not particularly helpful. So again, if you know something that's really good, and and things like IndieBound and Nora's site, you know, yes, those the book do. list reader, we're going to talk about a lot of different things on that site. Book Riot talks of a variety yeah. of stuff. So you'll find nonfiction on there. You'll find some multicultural stuff on there. So, But something yeah. specifically about nonfiction, especially popular non, I mean, there's a lot, a ton of academic nonfiction sites, but something about popular nonfiction is hard to find, or we've so, found it hard to find. So that's our plea. Get in touch. <laughs> um, Book nerdery, Yay. general book nerdery <laughs> sites. So these, uh, the, the next, we have them all on one slide here. These three sites are not blogs, but we thought they were important enough for you to know about. Um, the first one is Kent District Library's What's Next. This is another one of those that I've talked about since 1999. Uh, it used to be a publication. I hesitate to call it a book because I think it was a loose leaf binder that they updated. Um, it's fabulous though, and this is one of those sites. Again, I love these sites that make you look like the most brilliant librarian on the planet, seriously. Every time that I use that site, Kent District Library, the patron looks at me as though I'm a genius. Maybe they think I wrote this myself. Um, this is basically any book in a series, in series order. So you type in, you know, the patron comes up and says, oh, I can't remember who wrote this, but I remember the title. And it was, you know, one of Nora, Rollins's eight million, or, uh, Nora Robertson's eight million series books. And you plug in that title, and it's going to bring you a list of every book in that series in the proper order. And it's they're very easy to print out and just hand to your patron, and they go, "Wow, she just typed that all up for me out of her brain." Um, but it's it's wonderful. It's a brilliant site for that. So anytime you're looking for series information, that's the only place you need to go. And you know, we pay some vendors huge amounts of money for sites that do something similar. There's no authentication for no. this. There's no waiting while you log in or go to your library's database page and then log in to do this. So the free version to answer this question is a lot better in terms of the patron standing right in front of you and valuing their time than often the resource that we're paying for. Yeah. It's really nice. The next one on this slide is Shelf Awareness. And really, this is Shelf Awareness is a daily e-newsletter, but why bother Smart. subscribing to it if you can just treat it like a blog, you know? <laughs> Same thing, right? Um, it's one of those things that's meant for the book trade. Similar to how Galley Cat has that sort of insider view, that's what shelf awareness does too. Um, it's insider news, information on upcoming books, who's going where, pertinent ads from publishers. And um, there's two versions of this actually. There is a version for the book industry and there's one for regular readers as well. I subscribe to both of them and have them filter into the same folder in my email box so that then I just go through and look at it. The one that's meant for readers is definitely more commercial, less kind of industry insider gossip stuff and is more ad heavy, but that's not a bad thing because it's, it's again, it's meant for readers who are on top of things and who want to know about stuff before it's hit the bookstore. So it's a lot of stuff um, for upcoming news and information. And then the final one on this slide is Flashlight Worthy Books and it is a site that features nearly 400 book lists on a variety of topics, 54 different categories, 437 unique lists over 5,000 different books and it's constantly growing. Um, the most interesting part of their, sec uh, of their site is a section where readers can post book related questions which are often readers advisory questions for other readers to answer. But anytime you're looking for a new display idea or something to print out as a bookmark, um, they have all these different lists here of um, just you know really easy quick and dirty information. Okay, so at the beginning we talked a lot about how the blogosphere doesn't really exist in the way that it did, you know, five years ago. There are lots of other platforms for people to quickly share information with a large audience and create a sense of community. Um, I could not track down the source of the sentence podcast with the new HBO, but I heard it last week and it really resonated with me. Serial, like all of a sudden, made people aware of podcasts. Um, if you or anyone that you love has ever listened to NPR, you know that podcasts <laughs> exist and have been around for a long time. 
And because of the, the nature of it, they've had a nice crossover with people who are readers. Podcasts are a fantastic way to multitask. They're a great thing to listen yeah. to in a commute or while cleaning. Or I have a lady um, who I used to work with at another library who, not with podcasts, but with audiobooks, would play her kids' video games while they were at school. Um, but she felt guilty about doing that, so she would listen to audiobooks, so she felt like she was doing something good for herself at the same time. So that's a little hack that you might be able to use. Uh, some of the ones that I like, stack of books... Nancy Pearl has like four podcasts going on right now. Where is she that, I don't know. Um, but this is one of her newest ones and one that I like because it's a conversation. Um, you know, they have like surprise guests who drop in and what are you reading? And she she's one of those people like Becky who she could talk about the Seattle phone book and you'd put yourself on the reserve list for it. You know, like she's just so passionate about everything she talks about. The New York, it's called Inside the New York Times Book Review. I couldn't remember that yesterday when I was putting it on the list. Um, is really fantastic. If you don't have the time to read it every week, um, or if it's not something that's particularly relevant to the community that you're serving, it's normally about 20 minutes. They talk about two of the books that are being featured, sometimes with the author, sometimes with the person who was reviewing it. There's a little bit of bestseller news at the end that's really interesting. I just, it's a great capsule. Bet Segundo is not podcasting anymore. Oh. He did the most wacky, lovely literary fiction interviews, and he would do them at, like, diners or his friend's house. Um, really smart and interesting, and I, I didn't have time to look into why he's not doing it anymore, so I hope it's not something sad, perhaps just rebranding. Um, but those were great. Podcasts are also a fantastic way to get things to share if you're leading book discussion groups, to have those little audio snippets or to get a completely different perspective on an author or a reviewer. Um, <laughs> Michael Silverblatt from Bookworm is that guy for literary fiction and nonfiction. He does this show for KCRW in San Francisco and is legendary among the writers that he interviews for his intensity. I mean, he will have read a book three or four times and then gone back and read the rest of the author's canon to prep. And he's one of those guys who will like be bringing out themes that the author will be like, well, I, I didn't. That is a very critical reading of the text. <laughs> My goodness. Um, I mean, they're just kind of incredible for, you know, not only his knowledge and his, his absolute fandom, but the way that he can, can challenge the authors to think about their work in a different way. And that's another one where, like, if you've listened to one of those and then you go to your book group the next night, you have so many, you sound so smart. Uh, books on the nightstand. We used to have this in our general blog slide. Now they're doing more on the, not doing more, but they're spending a lot of time on their podcast as well. And I want to, I'm not going to be able to remember their names. It's a man and a woman. And she works for whatever Bantam Double Day Dell is called now. And he works for Random House. And so they're both in sales and for those publishing companies, but they're just huge book nerds, and they love talking about what they're personally reading, um, who their fantasy cast for a movie would be. So it's just you know like two people who work in the same industry going out every Friday night for like a cocktail and still talking about what they love. I mean, it's it's really it uh, it makes you want to move to New York and work in the publishing industry and be their best friend, <laughs> which apparently they don't have room for because I guess they get that question a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the New Yorker Fiction Podcast and Selected Shorts are both fantastic ways to, again, just get those little capsules. Selected Shorts has been around forever. You probably have the audiobooks on CD from the Symphony Space. I mean, it's got Alec Baldwin and Parker Posey, and there's one of Frances McDormand reading a Laurie Moore story that will just bring you to tears. If you or your patrons are fans of literary fiction and short stories, it takes some of the best working actors in the country and perfectly pairs them with um, both classic and contemporary short stories. Really, really good. Slate's Audio Book Club is not a book club for audiobooks. <laughs> it is an audio of their book club. So 
two of their editors and then some of their friends or other contributors from the online magazine will have read the same book. And there are frequently long gaps between them, which is kind of okay, because it's not something that I need or want to listen to every week. So then when I find there's a new one, it's always kind of like surprising and delightful. I have one more that I'd like to add to the list. Special surprise guest, <laughs> which is not on your handout, but it's called Circulating Ideas. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And um, the reason we didn't have it on the program originally is it's not a book podcast, but it is a librarian interview podcast. And um, I'm not just talking about it because I was interviewed, uh, but it really, it's, it's Steve Thomas is a librarian who has, this is his total labor of love. Um, he is going virtually uh, via the web across the country talking to librarians of all kinds, academic librarians, special librarians, public librarians, children's librarians, um, Anybody that will talk to him, he will sit down and put a mic in front of their face for 45 minutes and just let them talk about what they love about libraries, what they love about being a librarian, what they do, what it's like, what they're into. Um, so it's called Circulating Ideas. If you Google it, it's the first thing that comes up. So check out that podcast. Not book related, but library related. Okay, and Tumblr is weird. Someone, please <laughs> explain to me why. Like seriously, what? Why? Why? Why Tumblr instead of a blog? Well, it, I well, don't. I I refuse to understand. So it. here are a couple it's things. Just something I'm not getting. It's noise. Part of it is a sense of community. Mm. Like I mean, for me, it's it's <laughs> like like Twitter. You know, at first, no, there wasn't a lot of value, and then like. Once you spend a day or two really in the Twitter version, like this is how I'm going to use it. These are the people I'm going to follow. These are the people I'm going to make like lunch plans with through Twitter. Like you find out how you're going to use it. If you're not living there, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. And a lot of the appeal of Tumblr is that sense of community, which is why things can't. This is your not safe for work warning. Can get super weird because it's a community where people are very comfortable with anonymity. And so they'll put up a lot of mashups and a lot of pictures of people without articles of clothing on. Um, and then there's also like this really super legit side where a lot of authors now their main yeah. online presence is Tumblr. And they don't say like, this is my Tumblr. Like this is my site. You know, a lot of people are visiting, you know, people in this room have visited a Tumblr site and just not even known it. One of the things that's also appealing about it is the scalability. You know, a Tumblr will pop up to like capture a meme that's super hot. Um, do you remember like, um, oh, oh, when What's His Face talked about his binder full of women? Clinton. Do you remember? <laughs> and so like there was a Tumblr and it was people like sending in pictures of their binders full of women. And, and it, had, you know, it spiked and it was huge and people were like posting stuff for three and a half days. And then it was gone. And so that's. So it's kind of like a blog that anybody can post to. Like you set it up, but then your commenters fill it. Is, if that's how, if you, that's choose how you choose for that okay. one, to, yeah. So the, I still don't get it. the scalability <laughs> of it, um, the, the linking to the other people with similar interests in the community is a, a big part of some of the people who use it. And gotcha. then just the ease of use. You know, one of the things that's nice about Tumblr, it's way easier than other blog platforms yeah. to put in video clips and images and that kind of stuff. It's super, super user friendly. I mean, I remember going to a program at North Suburban Library System, what it had to be at least five years ago, and someone, it was probably more like seven years ago, and someone talking about Tumblr, like, how would want, hmm, like there's so much to like about it, but I'm just not sure. I don't know if it lasts. And, and it's lasted, but it's another one of those things, not the way that people thought would take off. This community kind of grabbed it and made it their own. Yeah. And so, um, I'm just, the link to this Mashable list is on your handout sheet. So if you're looking for some somewhat vetted Tumblr sites to visit, go visit Mashable and just click on all those hyperlinks and see what all the buzz is about. Oh, and, and Maud, Maud Newton is an example of an author or of a, a blogger who moved over there early on. And she's a, a critic and a writer. And hers is a good example of, um, you know, you're not going to, on most Tumblrs, you're not going to see the length of post that you do on a traditional blog. There's a lot more multimedia. There are a lot of images with no caption or context. You know, it's just a quick place to, and we now use the term pin, to pin something up. It, it can be kind of a, a scrapbook of your thoughts and feelings and things that you want to share. And speaking of pinning. What? 
Um, so Hinsdale Public Library, the fabulous Emily Borsa maintains our Pinterest presence and uses it really, really successfully to highlight new titles, uh, book read-alikes, things by genre, celebrate. We've got the library reads link up there. And it's something that people just found. Like we did not initially do a ton of promotion and then, you know, like <laughs> three weeks after it's up, Emily says like, We've got 100 people following our boards. Like, that's cool, right? Yes, that's super cool. Um, you know, and we're a community where a lot of people are using it for their personal hobbies, which I think is probably every community in America. And so to have a place really, and you might also like books, let us draw you in. Um, so Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, these are all places where, you know, books are a hobby for people. And so people are creating a presence there and sharing things. I put up Paulo Coelho as an example because he has nearly 26 million followers on Facebook. Um, if you and and I, I know. and something that I don't think people, a lot of people don't understand, is that publishers now expect authors to be responsible for managing yes. so much Big of time. their own publicity. Like it is an expectation that you will create and maintain a strong social media presence. And like, you know, if you start making enough money, you can outsource that and you can have, you know, like the girl in the office who does my Facebook page. But a lot of new authors um, come in and they're told these expectations and not really given a lot of guidance. So you'll see some things that are out there because they were told they have to do it, um, but they're, they haven't found their voice, they haven't found their audience or their sense of community yet. Clearly, Paolo, not one of those people. And then Twitter, there are some of the sites that we talked about that have a strong presence. Like I said, I use that instead of an RSS feed, you know, so I follow Booklist Reader on Twitter and then they just push out every time they update something and I click on a little hyperlink and I read it. Wow, you're so modern. I'm super modern. I'm going to hold <laughs> on to my big reader until they pry it from my cold, dead hands. And then you know, a lot of authors, and surprising authors, like you wouldn't think Margaret Atwood would be like one of the she's hot tweeting. shots. She's, <laughs> she's, she's not only tweeting, but like super flirting with Rob Delaney, who's like this kind of blue comedian. And they've had like this great relationship. Like Time Magazine talked about their Twitter romance. It's kind of hilarious. <laughs> um, so if you have, you know, like personal favorites, like Twitter's a really interesting place to see how they're interacting with their readers in the online community. All right, so that is our tour. So to kind of wrap it up, let's bring it back to work, shall we? <laughs> Do we have to? Do no. we have to go back to work? Do I have to go back to the library? <laughs> so bringing it back to the library. So um, of course, these are, we've, we've tried to give you things that you can feel comfortable doing as part of your work day, on the desk, you know, when the director walks by and says, ooh, book covers, she's cool. <laughs> uh, that's all right. Um, so what else can you do with this in your work life, though? And one of the things that we, kind of thought about was sharing these things with your patrons. Um, so it brings to mind that kind of the gossip factor, right, that works well. You know, you talk to your patrons about books, and when you talk to them about something that you just read on a blog, and <clears throat> you let them know where you heard about this, they're like, ooh, she's like media savvy, right? And oh, that's a blog I'm going to go home and look at. Like, it just helps you sort of deepen that relationship that you have with your patrons when you're, when you're talking about when you're talking to them about things that they are doing, right? Everybody is looking at social media these days and everybody is reading, clicking news articles and blog links. And if you start talking about that in that language, it, it, you're, you just kind of really seem that sort of chatty and appealing and you know what you're talking about. So. And there was a study a couple of years ago that women um, are more likely than men to retain information if it is perceived as gossip. I don't so, know what you're talking about. So the difference between saying, you know, there's going to be a lag between the next one because John Sanford is switching publishers. That is information that you are sharing with your patron and will be stored in a certain part of the brain. For your female patrons, say, I just read that John Sanford is switching publishers. And so there's going to be like three months where nothing comes out. It's all over Galaxy. Oh. <laughs> That's all they can talk about lately. Yeah. Which one are <laughs> is your patron going to tell their spouse about? And so they're not only saying the story, be like, yeah, 
the lady at the library was like all over it. Apparently, she has access to like these super secret, secret publisher blogs. Publisher blog. I mean, again, that you know, increasing your credibility, demonstrating your areas of expertise to your public, talking about it with an authority, and like, I follow this stuff. This is my, I'm your girl. You come to me with your book yeah. questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, link to these things. Link to these things on your library website, on your library blog. If your library has the Facebook page and the Twitter, <laughs> the, the. Like, I'm going to the Jewel today. What is that? Um, <laughs> if your library has those things, start pushing this stuff out there. Again, it makes you look relevant. It makes you look like you know what you're talking about, and you are probably sharing stuff. You know, your average patron doesn't know about Galley Cat. I bet you anything. Your average patron doesn't know, stop, you're killing me. And if you kind of push those things out to them, they're like, ooh, one more thing that proves my librarian is so much smarter. Like, that's, that's hang on to that. And, and that's why that. we do what we that do, is. people, is to prove to other people how smart we are. It's the <laughs> I sure picked the right profession. Um, so, yeah, so feature those things. And we used to have to say this last part a lot more than we do now, but I think everybody's pretty savvy. Don't discount blogs when they come up in your search results. If you're looking for something, if you're looking for information about a particular book or information about an author, you know, it used to kind of be like, oh, Joe Blow's Stephen King fan page. Well, I'm not going to print that out and give it to my patron, or I'm not going to talk about that with my patron. Times have really changed, and, and you can't discount that stuff anymore. That is where the news is coming from. That is the stuff that people are interested and in looking for. So that's kind of our little plea for that. And that wraps it up, I think. So if you have any blogs or websites that you would like to share with us, we always love to hear about this. We're always keeping this updated um, because, you know, again, we want to feel so smart. <laughs> so help us out with that and let us know if there's stuff that you know about that you think we should know about. And otherwise, that's, that's what we have to say. And we can take questions if anybody. Yeah, I don't want to discourage anyone, but what happens when we do these recordings is if you say something, if you say something your audience would want to hear, if you're not mic'd, then they're not going to hear it and be frustrated. So I'll just ask you. Say it loud, say it proud. The broadcast here, but for the recording, in case you tell us a great resource, we want those that are watching the recording to be able to hear it. Or if you have questions. Yeah, you don't just have to I ask us. We should, I see you. we should acknowledge that you also have things to share. <laughs> yeah. I will be brave and take the microphone. Um, First is a resource. Uh, there's a great one I follow called Diversity in YA. Thank you. So if you have a uh, population of Hispanic or Native American or African American, or if you want to reach out to disabled teens and want, you want um, protagonists they can relate to, Diversity in YA uh, is, you can access it just as a website or it is on Tumblr. And I can explain the appeal of Tumblr for these things. <laughs> Please do. Enlighten me. Enlighten me. All right. It is that it's sort of a super RSS feed where okay. not only are you getting the posts of what you subscribe to, but you're getting the very best of what they subscribe to with their comments. Okay. So that's the appeal of Tumblr for these things. Thank you very much. I really <laughs> appreciate you helping me out with this because I just feel so stupid. Every time I talk about Tumblr, I'm like, I'm not that old. I swear I'm not. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Any other comments or suggestions for us? All right. Well, thank you very thank much you for having us. Thank you all very us. much.